Thank you. Thank you. So I had this really amazing experience last semester here at Brandeis. I taught the very first queer studies course in the School of Creative Arts, which was really important to me. And I taught a course in queer theater. And uh, the, one of the reasons why this was so meaningful to me was a lot of the playwrights we studied and we talked about were playwrights that I had learned when I was in college, but we never talked about the fact that they were gay. Like that was a secret. We had some sort of sense of that, and I think I had some sense of that, but it was never really discussed. And so to actually look at that um, quality, that contribution of these artists in the world was really meaningful to me. And the first artist that we talked about was a playwright named Oscar Wilde. How many of you have ever heard of Oscar Wilde? No, almost everybody. Oh my gosh, that's so amazing. Oscar Wilde was born in 1854, and he died in 1900. So you know he preceded us by some time. But I think of him as kind of an ancestor who shaped my identity. You know, I feel like a connection sometimes to great figures, artists or writers or musicians or actors that lived before me, and I feel more a connection to them than my own blood relatives. And I feel like Oscar Wilde in some ways lives on in me in a lot of different ways. First of all, I love his fabulousness. He was like the first fabulous person in the world, and I almost never use the F word. But he was really, you know, he was in the forefront. And he was so witty. He was so smart. When he, um, the first time he came to the United States, he uh, strolled through customs and he said, I have nothing to declare but my genius. Um, and, but probably my favorite Oscar Wilde line was, um, or his dying words. So Oscar Wilde, um, at the, the time in which he lived in Victorian England, it was illegal to be gay. And when it was discovered that he was gay, he, um, if it had happened a few years before, he would have been put to death. But at that time, he was put in prison for it. And when he finally was released from prison, he fled England and moved to Paris, where he lived in poverty under an assumed name, changed his name, living in disgrace. And he died in kind of this horrible, dilapidated, rundown hotel room, where reportedly his dying words were, Either that wallpaper goes, or I do. <laughs> now, what is sometimes forgotten about Oscar Wilde, though, is that he was really a brilliant philosopher of the role of art in society. And again, this is where he helped shape some of my thoughts and ideas about this. When he was young, Oscar uh, espoused this theory called aesthetics. And he felt the purpose of art was to beautify our lives. So we want to surround ourselves with beauty. We want to surround ourselves with beautiful paintings, beautiful music. His plays are filled with beautiful young people wearing beautiful costumes saying beautiful, witty things, right? And I have no apology for that, right? That is part of the function of art, is to bring beauty into our lives. And surely, you know, we have all delight in the opportunity to feel a sense of awe and wonder at a work of art and beauty, whether it's The Lion King on Broadway, or the movie of Life of Pi, or Handel's Messiah, or a mural by Marc Chagall, right? There's, there's a natural impulse in us that wants to feel awe at beauty and be awakened to beauty in the world. As Oscar got older, his philosophy shifted a little bit, and he became much more interested in the role of art to change the world. Now, wrap your mind around this. He thought the that art, not economics, not politics, and not religion should be the foundation of civilization. This was a radical and terrifying notion to the Victorians, and it's even really kind of unthinkable to us now, right? Isn't it? Right, what if though we dialed it back a little bit and just said art should be as important to society as economics, religion, or systems of government? Could you embrace that? When you look at the news every night, right? Uh, when we look at um, the local news, we have the current events, which I understand. We want to know if there's someone running around our neighborhood with a gun, or if there, someone has been elected president or pope, right? We, we want to know that, right? And then we have weather, right? That makes sense to me, too, right? We want to know, like, should I dress warm or cold or take an umbrella? That's, that's great. The third, thing, the third thing that the news reports to it is what? Sports. And what is sports, when, when you look at the sim, sim, symbolism of that, what are, they, what are the sports casters saying to us? Somebody won, somebody lost. Somebody won, somebody lost. Somebody was defeated, somebody was defeated. Somebody was defeated and somebody triumphed. And I think sometimes, who decided of all the things in the world, the third thing that we should spend a third of our days on in our current events were sports? What if it was art, as Oscar said? What if when you turned on the news, they said, oh, let's just take three minutes to look at this painting. Let me share this poem with you. Just sit still for a minute and listen to this piece of music. Oscar felt that would humanize us to the point where eventually we wouldn't need war, we wouldn't have wars anymore because it would awaken in us a certain capacity for compassion, for empathy. 
And this idea is really interesting to me. Does the artist as citizen have the capacity, the ability, or perhaps even the responsibility to help change the world? What function does art have in influencing social justice, which is a core value of us here at Brandeis University? Now, most of us would agree that the arts have some ability to influence thought. We could probably all name a movie or a song or a play that we've seen that made us think or feel something that we never had before, right? But when does art cross the line from expression, creative expression, to propaganda? If art is an expression of personal truth, whose version of the truth are you going to believe? Perhaps the arts invite us to experience multiple, divergent, and even contradictory truths. The arts communicate not only the beauty, but the ambiguity of the human experience. Now, most learning that I do my, in my brain is cognitive. My brain learns the color blue, or a fact from history, or a mathematical formula, like 2 plus 2 equals 4, and that's consistent throughout time. Art does the opposite. Art reminds our brains that some things are infinitely and gloriously unknowable. How can one name in concrete terms a uh, Beethoven sonata? or a painting by Jackson Pollock. Or, you know, Shakespeare wrote Hamlet 400 years ago, and we still don't know if it's better to be or not to be, right? <laughs> now, I've seen probably a different dozen, a dozen different productions of Hamlet in my lifetime. And each new production reminds my brain that no single interpretation of that play is correct or definitive. And so my brain must continually relearn and reevaluate that play's themes and ideas for their unique personal and social relevance to my life in this moment. So this process expands our brains and changes our perception of truth. The arts, by their very essence, invite us to see the world through somebody else's eyes. There's a survey I know of that, that proved that a young person who's been in a play, for example, in high school is 40% more likely to condemn racist behavior than someone who has never been in a play. Because they have literally imagined themselves into somebody else's circumstance. It makes sense, doesn't it? So in this way, the arts are a powerful antidote to social structures that encourage us to see the world in absolute terms, good or evil, conservative or liberal, red state or blue state. Art reminds us there's so many colors in between. And by reminding us that human beings and human nature is changeable and sometimes paradoxical, the arts can stimulate choices that are empathetic, ethical, and yes, I think even hopeful. Attending a concert or a play or going to a museum like the Rose Art Museum is an increasingly rare and precious opportunity for us to turn off our cell phones and step away from our computer screens and experience a live moment of interaction, a shared moment of time with other human beings. Flawed, damaged, compassionate, brilliant, magnificent human beings. To breathe the same air and feel the pleasure of each other's company. A moment like we're sharing now. I could have just emailed you this speech, <laughs> but it wouldn't have been the same, right? This is experiential. Theater, music, and the visual arts allow us to see beyond the categories, to experience dimensions that defy economic, racial, and geographical categories. They illuminate the emotions behind complex social issues. They transcend polarizing sound bites or political rhetoric. The arts invite us to unlock our ethical imagination. You know, when I think back to ancient Greece, I don't remember who won the Peloponnesian War. But I am grateful for the tragedies of Euripides and the poetics of Aristotle and the magnificence of that Parthenon. And it's no surprise to me that the civilization that created the most magnificent art and culture the world has ever known also created democracy because the two expressions of freedom are inseparable. Oscar Wilde's teacher, the great philosopher William Morris said, history has remembered the kings and the warriors because they destroyed. Art remembers the people because they created. So as artists, as thinkers, as feelers, as dreamers, must we choose between beauty and justice? Or can they somehow coexist 
in an experiential moment, which is simply and profoundly human. In 1898, my friend Oscar wrote, in time, the forms of expression will change, but the principle will remain the same. The objective of art is to stir the most divine and remote chords that make music in our souls. We spend our days looking for the secret of life. Well, the secret of life is in art. Thank you.